It's Didi on the Spot. Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And today, before I get to my guest here, I'd like to remind everyone to give a like and subscribe down below if you enjoy this content. We greatly appreciate it. She is an Instagram star. She has a great page. It's all fitness related, and it, I can guarantee it will humble you to go and look at her page. She is a lot more in shape than you are, and I don't care if you're any of those gym guys that say, oh my God, yeah, I'm so in shape. Like I work out all the time. If you go and look at one of her page, it will humble you, and you will want to go and work out for the rest of your life. We have Dasha here, or Dasha, sorry, I, I got one of those right, I think, but yeah, um, she, yeah she's getting her um, master's at from Tufts University School of Medicine, and she is here on the podcast with us to talk about fitness and health related stuff. Dasha, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. So why don't you give us a little bit of a backstory on how you got started into fitness, kind of uh, what inspired you and what you're up to currently? I was sick of being called skinny and I wanted to get strong. So I took it upon myself. I was like, you know what, girl, you're going to start lifting. <laughs> <laughs> so I started working out in the gym, um, started putting on muscle, and I've always been really into research, into science. So that kind of took over and I kind of went into more of the bodybuilding research and exercise and physiology and um, nutrition and now I've kind of geared more into gut health um, specifically and disease um, associated with dysbiosis and things like that. Just warning everyone ahead of time there will be a few words in here that you might not understand but you can always go and look them up. Um, when you so were starting <laughs> out with your fitness journey um, what was your biggest challenge and how did you overcome it? Um, definitely was um like hearing people's negative commentary. So people were like, when I first started either my Instagram, actually people were like, that's weird. Why are you doing that? They would laugh. They would, I mean, honestly, I, I will say that I cried multiple times because of like the hurtful things that people had said to me and um, just the lack of support, I guess. But I just kept going because I knew that it brought me happiness and I had made so many cool connections and so many inspiring people. I kept going and, it's my passion. So don't ever let anyone tell you not to follow your dreams and your passions because at the end of the day, it's what makes you happy. That's one thing that I really have come to realize. Like I've been, I've been in kind of, I don't do fitness competitions or anything, but I've been working out a lot by myself for probably like the last four years. And I've been following a lot of the fitness community. And one thing that I really came to realize is that it is a very tight knit, close community that everyone like supports each other. And most people who are kind of out of that community don't get that, but there's a huge support system, which I really think helps with all of the athletes and everyone that's competing in there. And, um, when you were starting out as well, what was the what was your um, go to kind of diet that you did? Did you have any? Did you like to change diets a lot, or was there a diet that you stuck stuck with the entire time? What's funny is uh, my brother's a marine, actually. So wow. when I first started gaining weight, um, I was like, "How do I do this? Like, tell me how to gain weight on like the Marine Corps diet." <laughs> He's like, he's like, well, you got to eat the burger and then just have like a scoop of ice cream and a peanut butter sandwich. And I was like, okay, I got this. I got this. And I did. I gained, I gained like, um, I did track my macros though. Um, so I had a caloric set that I would push myself to eat to because naturally I'm not that hungry and I have a pretty fast metabolism for someone who's my size. Um, so I just went with it and I think I gained like seven pounds in five weeks or something. Wow. My first, I mean, you get like the newbie gains kind of, yeah. um, so you put on a lot of muscle really quickly. So that was great. <laughs> yeah. What, how did, um, how did like your friends that you had before, how did they react to it? Cause I know sometimes a lot of people get like the mixed reactions, but a lot of it are supportive. What, what was that for you personally? So I had a boyfriend at the time who was really supportive, but didn't quite understand what I was doing and why. So it was kind of a mixed emotion. I heard from his friends they were like, what are you, they were kind of giving him crap for it, and which I ended up hearing about. So that was hurtful, but I, it was fine. I mean, again, here I am today, still, yeah. still going. So absolutely. So when you were picking topics or when you were picking kind of what you wanted to uh, study a lot more in college, what made you choose nutrition and gut health? That's a great question. So I actually started out, um, my undergrad was in honors biology. So I actually did my thesis on um, the carbohydrate perception of um, diabetics. So I kind of looked at what they thought, what their opinion was, like, could they actually count 
count carbohydrates. I mean, they're probably a population that would be the most the most well versed in carbohydrate counting. Mm -hmm. And what I found was that they didn't really know much about carb counting. They didn't know much about fiber. They didn't know much about artificial sweeteners. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I was at when I graduated from undergrad. Um, from there, I went to get my master's at Tufts and I transitioned more into gut health as a result of being diagnosed um, with celiac disease. Mm -hmm. So I, this is an autoimmune condition and around the fall of my first year of my master's, I began experiencing severe stabbing cramps that I thought I would need to be hospitalized for. Um, and from there, I just dove into the gut microbiome and things like that. Um, and so I was reading a lot of literature about that. So that's kind of how I ended up in this. <laughs> Out of all the research that you've done and all of the studying of gut health, what would you say is the most surprising fact that you came up with that you really, you really didn't know ahead of time? You know what's interesting is that you can. I think there's there's always an excuse as to why you shouldn't eat something, and I think that people over. They, be, they make their diet religious, right? And it's not meant to be a religion. It's just it's just food that you put in your mouth at the end of the day. Like, <laughs> I could, if you think that this is a better option for you, then fine. But if you're trying to tell me that scientifically eating whatever it is is going to be better for you than this, I can tell you a hundred reasons why that food is bad for you. Mm -hmm. Just like you could tell me a hundred reasons why that food is good for me. So instead of being religious about it, just accept the fact that nothing's going to be perfect and it is what it is. Yeah. Well, and I just think too, it's, it's kind of hard to judge exactly what food's going to do to a certain person because everyone's different. Everybody's body can process stuff differently, which is a hard thing for, I think, a lot of people that don't have that type of knowledge when it comes to nutrition. They're, they're kind of like, oh, why so-and-so can eat this, and then they, it helps them lean up. But when I eat it, it helps me bloat a little bit. But um, one of the gut questions that I, that I got from people that I was asking about before uh, this podcast was a uh, – what, what do you think makes processed food tend to cause more infl inflammation? Is it the stuff that they put in it or is it just the way that they make it? How does that tend to work? Yeah, so a lot of processed foods are made with a lot of additives. Um, a lot of those additives are made from corn byproducts, which um, are sprayed with pesticides. And then through the processing, it's just bioaccumulation, all these weird toxins and binders and a lot of the products that we get have these binders right in the gums and once we start eating more of these gums they kind of just like sit in our gut and they just stop it from functioning properly um, and the toxins can accumulate and cause intestinal permeability which just means that your gut isn't holding up right. It's letting nutrients pass through its barrier and into your bloodstream. So you're getting toxic load from whatever food that you're eating into your blood directly, which is not good for anything. Why do the companies that make this stuff, why do they put so much of that stuff in it? Is it to make it um, easier to produce or what's the whole plan behind processing it like that as opposed to just growing it naturally like other people do? Mm -hmm. So a lot of those binders and um, other things are added to the product um, because when they're put on the um, industrial line, I, I don't know exactly what it's called, but when they're manufacturing it, in order to prevent it from sticking to the actual machines, they have to put some sort of like barrier that'll make it slippery so that when it can fall and move on off of the um, off of the barrier, and that's why they add a lot of those additives and also it obviously for um, preservatives so that it can last longer on the shelves and because um, a lot of companies won't take products that won't last long on the shelves because it will decrease their profitability. Oh, that's, that's, that's very interesting. Like I didn't get, I, I never got all that stuff. So I've already learned something new from this podcast already and we're just getting started. So when it comes to the different types of fat, I was surprised. I thought fat was just fat. I thought I'd just eat fat and then it might help me like gain weight or whatever. But I didn't know that there were two types of fat. At least there, there's, there's visceral and then there's subcutaneous. Um, could you maybe describe the differences between those two? Yeah, so that's um, actually, those aren't types of fat necessarily like compound wise. So types of fat compound wise would be like omega-3s, omega-6s, 
um, those kind of things. But this type of fat is just the um, storage. So we have what's called visceral fat, which is the fat that surrounds our organs. And then we also have sub subcutaneous fats, and that's the fat that we see underneath our um, skin layer. So that's the one that we um, are – that's like the excess energy that we take in through calories. That's kind of stored as subcutaneous fat right away. Um, and that's just like a normal buffer system. So that'll be um, more stubborn actually and more um, – uh, estrogen prone. So estrogen will increase the amount of subcutaneous fat that you can store um, versus visceral fat, which is the one that surrounds the organs. This one is more a predictor of metabolic syndrome and um, it's more insulin resistant. And it's also the first to go with stress, but it's also the last to leave. So what that means is that when our bodies are undergoing um, a period of caloric deficit, um, we will first get rid of the visceral fat because that's, again, that's not the good kind of fat to have. It's dangerous to have that surrounding our organs too much. So it's the first one to go in fat loss and weight loss. And um, then it's also the last one to leave because our organs want to stay alive, right? Mm -hmm. So they want to have some sort of protection around them. So it'll stay on the longest, but the subcutaneous fat is more of the stubborn fat that we have a hard time getting rid of, things like that. I also found really interesting, um, I didn't know how much stress actually can play a part in you gaining weight or like retaining a lot of, a lot of maybe like fat. And how does that exactly work? Because it's just, it's just one of those things that blows my mind where it's kind of like a mind over matter thing. If you can stress yourself out to kind of like influence how much like weight you can put on, how does that exactly work? Yeah, so um, when we're stressed out, we increase this hormone called cortisol, and this is highly involved in a lot of regulatory processes in the in the body. So this can be easily affected by something like not sleeping enough at night, and um, you have raised cortisol the next day because your body isn't relaxed enough, and this is prone to inflammation, and more inflammation makes your body retain and hold on to a lot of the fat storage is more, and a lot of waters and things like that, because it's just in an inflamed state. It's very high stress, um, and what's funny, actually, is a lot of people, when they're on um, PrEP, they actually stress themselves out. They're like, I'm not losing weight. I'm not yep, losing weight. Yep. Oh my God. And their cortisol is just rising cr like crazy just from them stressing themselves out from not losing weight. Mm -hmm. That if you were to take like a few days break and just like chill, just relax, <laughs> yeah. your cortisol yeah. decreases and all of a sudden you're losing weight again. Mm -hmm. And no caloric changes, no nothing. Just the fact that you're sleeping well, you're relaxing and everything, the systems just fire up and they go and check. Sleep is another huge thing that I, I think is also most people don't understand. People always, like a lot of people that when I first started out working out, I just thought, hey, if I just like keep working out, stay on a schedule, like it doesn't really matter as long as I eat a little bit. But sleep is one of, if not the most important thing when it comes to recovery and growth. When I can tell immediately if I get like five hours of sleep in a day as opposed to eight hours. If I get eight hours, I feel like I could conquer anything. I feel invincible, but five hours is just groggy, groggy. Um, how does that play when it comes to muscle growth and recovery? Because it's just, it's just a weird thing to factor when even an hour or two of sleep could make a huge difference. How does that play in when it comes to recovery? Yes, 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 yes. I think that honestly, sleep might be more important than your diet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, they're pretty equal. <laughs> if you're not sleeping enough, you're not recovering enough. Your muscles are growing during that sleep time. You need to give them that time in their REM cycle in order for them to recover. And if you're not recovering, you're just com you're not able to reach that plat that increase in the graph. You're just digging yourself deeper and deeper into a hole of stress and cortisol and just inflammation, and you're not getting anywhere. Yeah. Okay, one of the big questions that I got, I sent out to a lot of people that I know I, that I was having you on and they got excited and they were asking me. The biggest question that they asked me is um, bloating. I think that's a thing that affects a lot of people and it's a, it can be a huge stressor because you think that you're losing weight or you think that you're getting like in really good shape and all of a sudden you're just like, oh my God, I can't believe it looks like I gained like 10 extra pounds. There are a lot of things that people can do to eliminate bloating, but is there a way that you can eliminate all bloating? Because some fitness posts that you hear, Instagram posts, are like, eliminate all your bloating. But is there always going to be a little bit of bloating just because it's something natural that happens, or how does that work? 
Yeah, so there are certain, um, this is actually what I do through my core store coaching, um, which is just geared towards gut health and completely decreasing your bloat. I mean, I've had clients who have lost like eight pounds in a week from decrease in bloat. And you think that that's not normal, but I, I know from IBS, IBD perspective, um, people who are suffering from bowel syndrome um, issues, that is real. <laughs> eight pounds of water weight is real and it hurts. It yeah. hurts like crazy. Mm. So to, mm. do not think that like that is like extreme or anything like that. Like it's painful. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of foods that can cause people to bloat. Um, the key is knowing what works with your body and what doesn't, which is what Cora Store is all about is finding those foods and what triggers you to just blow up. For some people, it's like tomatoes. For other people, it's potatoes. <laughs> like it's it depends on the person, but I usually have a pretty good idea of where to get going based on symptoms. So one of the big things I also got as well was uh, if you're lactose intolerant, what's a good substitute for milk? Milk is a huge thing when it comes to building protein. You use it in a lot of protein shakes. But if you're lactose intolerant, um, what would you recommend for someone who still maybe wants to build muscle or still get all the benefits that you'd normally get from something like milk? Uh, yeah, so it um, depends on what you're drinking milk for necessarily. So if it's just for the taste or for smoothies or something like that, I would highly recommend coconut milk. Um, almond milk, cashew milk, those are all really available um, at basically every grocery store. Um, if you're looking for more of the muscle building benefits of, um, of the milk and you're using it more like the protein source, mm -hmm. I would recommend mm -hmm. um, real essential amino acids, which are also vegan. So that would be a good source for vegetarians or vegans to spike the um, muscle protein synthesis. Or I also... Um, I found one company that has a pea and rice blend, which is the most research, researched um, vegan two combination uh, sources of protein to optimally stimulate um, muscle protein synthesis. So those are the two that I would do um, if you're looking for a protein source, then just supplement with uh, the essential amino acids or the powder. Yeah. So cravings are another big thing. I mean, I suffer from them a lot. I try to not get myself too many midnight snacks when I go down, and I try to, you know, stay away from the chocolate a little bit. But um, everyone suffers with cravings. What are some of the tips or what are the, some of the things that you have done specifically to kind of uh, get rid of the cravings and kind of make it so that it's a lot easier to kind of deal with them? Because I know that there are ways that you can do that. But how did you do it personally, and what would you recommend to people? Um, so first of all, I don't believe in restriction. So if I ever have a craving for something, I'll just get it over with. I'll just have some, like a bite of whatever, or a few bites of whatever. Usually I don't feel the need to like splurge and go overboard just because I know that I'm allowing myself to do it. And if I ever have the need to want it again, then I'll allow myself to do it. And it just kind of keeps this sane mentality around me. Um, that being said, I'm also not the type to crave bur burgers every day. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so if you're craving burgers every day, I think you need to start eating more whole foods <laughs> to begin with. Um, and maybe just start looking at that. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm guilty. I went to Five Guys at about noon today. I had a burger today, but that's the only burger I'm having this week. Trust me, like I said before, if you look at her Instagram page, you will take one look of her, like one look of one of her pictures working out, and you're going to say, I'm never going to eat fast food or anything else again. I need to go work out right now. But one of the things that actually, I... Re I actually did have a burger today too, actually, now that I think about it. I But it's a little bit different. So yeah. I guess one of the other ways that you could curb your cravings is create healthier alternatives. So today, for example, I made um, for lunch post-workout, I had a chicken burger and I had some peppers and onions diced into it and that was off the grill. I order from Paleo Power Meals and um, I can share my discount code if anyone wants it, but um, I order from them and I get like um, meals delivered and one of them is like a free range chicken burger off on a portobello mushroom with sweet potato fries on the side and I had that for lunch. And to me, that's not like cheating or filling in a craving because it's made with like great quality meat it's made with sweet potatoes with olive oil um and i know those are what i would have eaten anyways 
So one of the things I also really enjoyed about your Instagram page, and I think it makes it a little bit different than all the other um, f- people that are in the health and fitness industry, is that you also a, a lot of them don't have the pictures that you have when it comes to like you show the foods that you're eating, you show kind of what what they should look like, and then you also have a seg- segment that I really really enjoyed, the Witch's Witch, where you have be- basically everyone. If you haven't seen this, she has like two things. She'll have like a Captain Crunch or, or just two types of like cereals or like anything that you might want to eat, like a candy bar, and then she'll have like things on the side of like their their stats and then you kind of got to guess which one is which um how'd you come up with that because that's a very ingenious way and it's a, it's a good way to help pe- get people interested in kind of what they're eating mm-hmm. so um a lot of times i would see people who would think like oh i got like avocado toast for lunch today um i'm being so healthy and i'm like well that's a great step forward you're using whole foods but Um, when you order avocado toast at your restaurant, your favorite restaurant, just make sure you remember that they probably used a whole avocado, which is a, like a lot of fat. It's a, it's basically like taking two handfuls of nuts and stuffing them in your mouth. Um, and just make sure you know that if you're trying to lose weight, it might not be the best option for you. Um, so just being aware of what is in foods that we eat, um, one processed food, it might look like it's oh so terrible and honestly if you're trying to lose weight at the end of the day calories matter more than anything Mm -hmm. um if that's your goal so one of the things that i really wanted to talk about here too is um you have competed a few times in um was it bikini or what did you do did you figure no i did bikini i'm way too small yeah (laughs) so when you're a lot of people don't understand kind of how how rough prep can be and how much dedication it takes they just see the end goal they they just see the results they don't understand all the hours of cardio that you might have to do or all of the workouts that you have to do and all the strict eating what is what is prep what has your experience been like on prep and uh if someone were like ask if they should would you recommend going on prep for someone To be honest, my experience with prep was unlike anyone else's. Um, I mean, I was eating like 300 grams of carbs up to my show day. Um, That is not typical. Um, Like, I was listening to people who, I mean, the top, top bodybuilders, they're eating like 30 grams of fat, like no carbs, like 300 grams of protein. Like, you are on a severe, severe diet um, to... And you feel like crap, honestly. You feel exhausted. Your one output for the day, your main goal, objective, is your training session. So you have energy for that, and you better make sure that's really the only thing you have energy for. The rest of the day, you're probably going to be asleep. (laughs) Yeah. And then one thing I also learned through watching like a few – a documentary that I watched on bodybuilding is that when you're at your show day, that's usually when the competitors are at their weakest because they've drained themselves a lot just to look good for the show, and they're obviously – they look fantastic because of they've been bronzed up and they have been working out a lot but I didn't realize just how you're kind of usually at your weakest point is that due to just restricting yourself for so long your body just kind of loses the the strength component but it still has the muscle how does that work yeah you're just at your weakest point um actually most people are have like filled out a little so usually leading up to a show you'll cut your carbs whatever you need to do um manipulate whatever and then um, on the day of or the day before you'll fill out your muscles just to make sure they're filled with glycogen so they appear bigger so you'll have more carbs in your diet and you'll actually feel probably pretty good on show day Mm -hmm. Um, but leading up to it you're at your worst because you're just so deep into a diet yeah so we talk a lot to – this is a podcast that so far has been focused on like musicians and bands and talking to them. And one of the questions that I really enjoyed asking them was what, what the thrill kind of is like performing live, what that makes – how that makes you feel, especially if you've like wrote a song and you've practiced it a million times. Like a lot of people have described it. It's kind of like a drug that – it's unlike any other drug they've ever tried. It's just a great feeling. I think the same could also be said for competing, but what is it like personally for you when you walk on the stage and all these people are cheering and you finally get to show off all that hard work and dedication that you've been doing for months and months? What is that feeling for like, like for you personally? So I actually grew up dancing. So of the 12 years of my life, I was on stage for recitals and everything like that. And that was actually the, the, the one thing that got me hooked onto competitions and was just being on stage again and being it's kind of like a solo you get this like 15 seconds you get to rock out as hard as you can show the 
best that you can. Everything you've been working for has been this 20 seconds. You better not trip yourself up and start like doing whatever you've practiced this 20 seconds for so long. Um, and all you can do is just do your best and showcase what, what you've been practicing. And um, a lot of people forget that a lot of it has to do with posing too. I mean, you spend hours on posing and trying to manipulate your body and contort it in different ways to make sure that the angle that people see you from is the best angle that you can possibly present yourself from. So if you're like 45 degrees off in your quad, like people will see that and it's not going you're not going to do as well. So every single movement is so important and a lot of people forget that. Is it hard when you're kind of uh, when you're done with a competition to kind of deal with the fact that you're not going to look as good as you looked on stage forever and that your body's going to bounce back? How do you deal with that like psychologically? Do you have to like prepare yourself mentally and say like I'm not going to look this good forever just I'm just going to prepare to know that I'm going to have to probably go on another diet and then start this whole thing all over again in order to look like that? How, how does that work for you? Yeah, so a lot of people struggle with body dysmorphia after a competition. They're like I'm shredded and I look amazing and what they it's hard to grasp is that it's not sustainable it's not healthy for a girl or a guy to be at that level of leanness um, your hormones are off your your cortisol as I was saying was off like everything is off in the system and you really need to do what you can to bounce back and optimize it um, as soon as you can um, it is hard. It is very hard um, mentally. It is, it's all about the mental game. People think that it's all a physical game, but bodybuilding is a mental, mental game. The physical output is so easy. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Let me yeah. tell you, like lifting weights yeah. is easy. Mentally, you got to do, you got to go in there every day to do it. You got to know to go home and train yourself in the kitchen. It's all a mental game. <laughs> So one of the questions that I thought would be interesting to ask you was, we're both from areas that can get very, very cold in the winter. I'm from Minnesota. You're from Massachusetts. How do you deal with that when it comes to always getting on time, working out, getting your workouts in when there might be like a foot of snow on the ground or there might be some like, let's up here it can get to be like negative 10, negative 20. I have a workout room in my house, so it's always easy for me like that. But for someone who doesn't, how, how do you deal with that during the winter, still getting those workouts in and also when you're when you live in the areas that we live in, you only have to really look good six months out of the year. To be honest, it, the other six months you can kind of just bulk up a little bit, just wear your sweaters, you'll be fine. Um, how how does that work for you in the winter? Still getting those workouts in and maintaining your um your uh, schedule. Yeah, that's a great question. So I honestly I look like a weirdo, but in the winter I don't even break a sweat. I don't think in the yeah. gym I wear sweatpants. Like I wear a sweatshirt. I look like a hoodlum, whatever. I just. I go in and I'm warm and I just make sure that I'm warm. And one of the things that I actually like to do, my gym has a sauna and I kind of made it this ritual where I would drink my pre-workout if I was drinking one or drink water or whatever um, in the sauna for like 10 minutes before I went into the gym. And it just, on the one side, it kind of got me tired because I'm like, oh, this feels great. Mm -hmm. But on the plus side, I was warmed up. Um, I was ready to go and fueled for a good gym session it's plus it was kind of like a treat right like you're yeah. like I get to drink my pre-workout and I get to be in the sauna for 10 minutes like let me just go to the gym <laughs> I was gonna say the people from the southern parts of this country that don't experience winter they will never know the struggle my biggest struggle always is when I whenever I'd leave the gym like in college and it was right after I'd done, I'd done legs and then you have slippery ice to deal with that is the oh. worst thing possible that is awful I the second worst thing, or for me, it's the first worst thing, is if you do sweat and you yes. go outside, that is bad. You really, I'm someone who's like, my mother always used to tell me like, bundle up in the cold or you'll get sick. So I'm always the type that like, if I were to sweat, I would wipe it off or I put on a hat. Like I look like a crazy person walking into my gym like an Eskimo, mm -hmm. but I make sure that I'm all all set and I'm warm. <laughs> I know because one time I remember I walked out of the gym and then I, I lived on campus. So I was only like probably like half a mile away. So I just walked home and then I had like frosted tips by the time I arrived back because everything just froze up and I looked like I was a part of Backstreet Boys and you know. It did It did help with some of the girls on my floor, but then after it dried away, you know, I lost all the chances. But um, when you were in college, a lot of people 
in college, you know, they can get a specific workout in because they have a set schedule. But a lot of people have so much to do in college, it's kind of hard to maintain that balance. When you were in college, what did was there any specific tips that you have in order to maintain that healthy lifestyle while still maybe being stressed out from finals or dealing with other life events? How did that work for you? Uh, that's a great question. So for me, it was easy to prioritize the gym because I have such a great passion for it. Um, for someone who doesn't really have a passion for it, I was in a sorority. And I think one of the best things that you can do is get like a gym buddy. Um, so I, I know like a lot of girls, like there would be like a 4 p.m. spin session. And at five, we all sit down for dinner. So what they would all do is like a group of five or six of them would all go and go to the spin class together and then come home and we'd all have dinner together. So that's another option is if you can find someone who's on your schedule who can join you at the gym, make sure you're going. Um, that is key. Yeah. I, yeah, I just think having a workout buddy works too. I had a roommate and we, we started to be workout buddies a little bit, but then I kind of got on my own schedule because I had, a, I had a weird sleeping schedule in college. So then I eventually was able to figure something out. But yeah, having a workout buddy to start out is really, really key. But one of the questions that I find a lot that a lot of people are asking, and there's like a big debate over is what age should um, someone really start serious weightlifting? Like, especially if you're an athlete, like I was a baseball player, there's always that thing where everyone's like, don't start touching weights until you're like 13, 14 or something like that, or until you're more developed. Um, what age do you think personally should someone maybe start serious weight training? And if I know it depends like person to person, but generally speaking, and then for, for the genders, is it different? Should maybe like guys start later than girls or vice versa? How does that, how is your opinion on that? Um, to be honest, I think that in any sort of movement should be encouraged for kids. Um, I don't think that like it would be wise at all to start heavy lifting mm -hmm. at a young age but going to the gym is not a bad thing mm -hmm. like going to the gym and learning how to use these exercises with, with proper form at a young age can actually probably lead to less injury as you get older because you're not you don't have that ego maybe necessarily yet that's putting on 50 pounds and then trying to do something with bad form i mean if you can start just exposure. I think that exposure at a young age is fine. Um, I don't think that competitive, um, com like a competitive athlete kind of thing is, mm. is a good thing. I know that I think I've seen on social media, like children in bikini shows and like that bikinis. is something where I, that is something where first of all, I'm like, I'm going to get arrested for looking at that. So I just, I just swipe as soon as I see it where I was like, that is so bad. That's like those kids in like those beauty, those beauty pageants where it's like, and plus, especially when you're lifting when you're young like that, that can do some serious damage when it comes to growth. And I mean, you see some kids that started that and they're only like five foot two when they grow up and it's because they're, uh, uh, that might be a big part of it. But I also kind of agree with you when it comes to like going to the gym just and just looking through things. I remember when I was like nine years old, I was playing basketball and one of the dads was really, really into health and fitness. He'd take us to the gym. We had a lifetime close to where we were and he'd take us there and then he'd like put us on like the pull up bar and then he'd help us up to make us feel like we were like, I was like, I'm so cool. Like I'm repping out like 10 of them. But then he's like put, helping me with like my legs, like lifting me up. Yeah, and it's but still that is like positive exposure mm -hmm. to a great environment that can lead to a lot of positive behaviors growing up like that's important yeah. Absolutely. And it's just all about, and you always find when it's, when it comes to the obesity problem in the United States, you always find that it's the fit parents. They, they, they instill in their kids, the values of working out and having good nutrition. And they're 99% of the time, they're the ones that then end up having a healthy lifestyle. So I think it does come from the parents too, to help educate their kids. But, um, another thing I want to ask you is, um, what actually, I, I just want to chime in on that. Um, uh, there's been studies actually done on that and kids will actually follow what their parents do more than they will if you tell them to do so like if you want to get your kids to be exercising the worst thing you can possibly do is force them to do it or and tell them to go to the gym the best thing you can do is say hey you can keep watching tv but i'm gonna go outside and do like 100 burpees burpees and like get a great sweat on and like do all this stuff and like eventually they're going to come out and do the burpees with you so mm -hmm. um, that's another great approach too yeah absolutely yeah. so um you were someone who's worked with a lot of people to kind of like help them lose weight and adopt a more healthier lifestyle um what is the number one excuse that you usually get from the average person as to why that keeps them from adapting to a more healthy lifestyle is it kind of food choices is it time and uh what what do you usually recommend for that person than when they when they tell you that huh, um 
Well, I'm going to say at the end of the day, everyone blames time. Mm-hmm. I don't have time for that. I don't have time to change my diet. All right, well, if you think about it, how much time does it take to change your diet? You're going to eat no matter what. You ate before, you're going to eat again. There's no t- additional time required. Mm-hmm. But what they, the, the problem is the shift, the getting them to commit to something. That's where the hardest thing is because at the end of the day, no matter what extra extrinsic motivation you have, which just means motivation from other people, from from looking at yourself in the mirror, from seeing someone who looks good, from hearing it from your doctor that you need to work out, no matter what the external motivation is, at the end of the day, it's the internal motivation that's going to drive a long-lasting behavior. So once it clicks on the inside, that's when you're going to see the most change. Yeah, absolutely. So when when you're taking those, first of all, I want to ask, when you're taking those Instagram pics, how many pics usually does it take to get the right angle down? Because I've always wanted to know, everyone, it always seems like they have like the perfect lighting and the perfect image. Is it a lot of trial and error? Or have you, is it something that you kind of get used to where you're like, oh my God, this is a great angle. I got to get a picture from here. Like this is great lighting. Is it, how does that work for you? Um. A, the limit does not exist, <laughs> and B, um, it depends. Yeah. So the yeah. selfie ones, um, you kind of get a hang of what, again, after posing so many times, you kind of know what looks good on you um, or what you feel most confident in, which I think is something that's more important. Um, the most confident you feel of portraying your body, no matter if it's the best angle or not, um, showing off your best self. I think that's what's important. Um and not in the sense that you should only be putting out your best, but I mean the the feeling of happiness, like putting out something that you don't feel good about, like that doesn't make sense to me. Um, but there are times, I'm not going to lie, where I'm just like, I need content and I don't really care if this is a crappy picture because <laughs> I need to post something yeah. and someone's going to think it's cool because to me it's not my best self, but I know someone to someone else that's not necessarily true. I have been behind the camera multiple times where it's, hey, Ryan, come and take the selfie for us. T- come and take this. And then, and then they look at it. It's not a good angle. No, you got to take it like 10 more times until you finally get it. So it is it is a process. But one of the, the questions that I probably really want to ask you the most is that you are such a positive influence for a lot of people. You've inspired so many people to like lose weight. And even just looking at your pictures, one gets the idea that you, know, you can at- attain that look and you can get healthy. But on the but on the other side, sometimes some people might see that and be like, "Oh, I'm never going to look like that." Like, what's what's the point? Like, how do you um, kind of mix and match that idea of like trying to post something that you know is really going to inspire people, as and as opposed to maybe posting something that someone's going to be like, "Oh, I'm never going to look like that," and then just like they get depressed. Do you ever think about that when you're posting stuff, or is does that affect you at all? Um, I don't know if I'm going to answer this correctly mm-hmm. um, necessarily what you're asking, but what I want to say is that you're never going to be happy with the body that you are attaining. So if you're not happy with it now, abs don't make you happier. Um, Changing your body doesn't make you happier. It's at the end of the day, it comes within yourself. Um, If you're not happy with your body now, and if you're not happy through the journey, you're not going to be happy at the end of the day when you actually attain these abs. And when you look like this, you're just going to be like, wait, but I didn't hit this and I did, you're never going to be satisfied. Mm-hmm. So to me, for someone to be like, oh, I'll never look like that. Like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you never will because <laughs> yeah. I'm me and you are you and you and I have different lives completely and um, you have to learn to be happy with what you have and work towards a better, the best self that you can provide yourself with um, and not the best self that I can provide you with. You have to focus on you mm-hmm. and I'm going to focus on me. <laughs> That's a huge lesson that I think everyone has to learn because we're all just in this social media area. Everyone's looking at everyone else and just trying to compare themselves. I was also going to ask, when it comes to Instagram and social media, do you think that provides an advantage or a disadvantage when you're about to compete? Because you can just follow the people that you think you're going to compete against, and you kind of get an, an idea of what they look like, where you're like, oh, if that person looks like this, I just have to attain this. Have you ever done that? And have you ever like heard of people saying that like Instagram's really helped me when it comes to knowing what, what the package that I'm going to need to bring for a show? Um, not really. I think, I think once you've 
compete. I think you learn not to compare yourself ever to anything, to other people. You don't compare your present state to your past state. You don't compare your present state to your future state. You compare your progress to just general progression. If you're getting better, that is all you should be focused on. Um, if you're getting worse, that's fine, okay? That's fine. That just means that there's an opportunity for growth in another way um, that you haven't tapped into yet. Yeah. So, I saw one of your posts on uh, Instagram, and it was you had you had a little bit of an imbalance in your shoulders, and then it was kind of like a post showing how you changed it. When someone has an imbalance, what are what are some of your tips that you have in order for them to correct that imbalance? Because everyone really has an imbalance when you think about. It. I mean, if you write right handed, your right hand's probably going to be a little bit stronger than your left. What are some keys to do to um, maybe correct that balance a little bit more? Yeah, so I just started focusing more on like so instead of doing um, barbell work, so you would be using two hands at once onto the barbell. I would just use dumbbells um, and make sure that there's unilateral um, work being done on each individual arm. Um, another great way would be like if just unilateral work in general. So focusing on one arm at a time and the other arm at another time um, and making sure that you're not adding more on the right side than you are the left side. So making sure that even though you feel like you could push out maybe five extra reps on the right side because it's stronger, you hold back because you know that the left side won't be able to catch up to that. Mm -hmm. And what's the point of growing your right side if your left side's going to stay the same? <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, I usually like to end these podcasts. We're right about the uh, we're right close to the end here, people. I like to end this with kind of like an inside the actor studio esque where I ask questions, just fun little questions, and I kind of have added up the responses. This is going to be a different edition since we're this is going to be the start of our fitness edition where we'll be having a few more um, health and fitness people on here and getting their responses to this. But I, these are just some fun questions that we like to get to know so being a music channel i gotta ask for the first question if there was one song that you could play that had to be like be playing on repeat all the time when you're working out or your best go-to workout song what is it and why i can't answer that i'm too way too embarrassed like i really don't i'm not really i'm gonna be honest i i listen to whatever is on spotify at the time um i will say that that song that was like the middle song that's really overplayed on the radio station. Oh, the Jimmy Eat World song, yeah. I have no idea what. Oh, yeah, cool, yep. <laughs> but loved that song yeah. when it was just played recently. But I honestly can't tell you. There's nothing that I'm not a good music person. I'm sorry. I know. I was going to say we had. I had always asked like guilty pleasure songs, and there was this one guy who was just like a hard death metal guy. And he comes on. He's like, "I want it that way" is my guilty pleasure song. And I was like, that's the greatest, that's the highlight of the podcast so far. I'm probably going to just have to tag it and then just make that its own separate video. But when, um, if you had the opportunity, and now this is another sort of question that I asked, but I'm making it fitness related. Now, and this could be anyone dead or alive, doesn't matter. If you had a chance to work out with one person, dead or alive, who would it be and what would you train? Dang. That's a hard one. Mm -hmm. Um... Honestly, I would pr I mean I don't know. I don't know about that one either. I would like You know what? Arnold Schwarzenegger had a really great everyone always emphasized his obliques. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if I had the patience to sit through an oblique workout with Arnold I would feel so much better about myself cuz I never <laughs> trained my abs. Yeah. That's a shock yeah. probably that people will know, but I like rarely train my abs. What? You I rarely know. train? What? Yeah. Are you kidding me? I literally, I literally was, uh, it was funny because before when I knew for her that you'd be on the podcast, I was telling a lot of people about it and then I showed it, I showed it to my parents and then, she, and then my, my, my dad's like, oh yeah, she definitely works out. My mom's like, holy crap, she must do like a thousand crunches a day. And I was like, oh, well, we learned something new, I guess. She doesn't train abs that much. Is it mainly just diet for you then? Yeah, I, I'm actually bulking right now. Oh. I'm eating close. Oh. I mean, I won't actually. I mean, actually, it doesn't really matter because it's a bulk. But I, I'm eating like close to three thousand right now, and not really gaining oh. weight. So I'm probably gonna bump it up soon. But um, yeah, and not really training abs either. I think I did abs two days ago because there was someone at the gym who was doing them, and I was like, "Do them! Like I'll do them with you." <laughs> um, when you're about to. Um, go to the gym or whatever. Do you have like a mental checklist of like stuff that you need to like do in order to like get to the gym or when you're there kind of like mentally prepare yourself or is it just where you just walk in and you're just good to go? How's that work? 
Um, I always will drink some sort of like pre-workout or drink before. Um, and then I just grab my bag, which has all of my, it's like this little backpack that has all of my, um, wraps and bands and things like that in it. And then get in the car and I'll go. And then, as I said, in the winter, I'll hop in the, I'll drink my pre-workout in the sauna. Mm-hmm. And that's about yeah. it. But in the summer, I don't, I don't, I just sit outside because the value of sunlight exposure is a whole nother topic that I can go into, but I should sit outside. Yeah. So when it comes to um, what you're up to currently, what, what are you preparing for a show? Are you just uh, helping out clients? How, how's that? What's that? What are you up to right now? Uh, right now, I'm just trying to grow and put on a lot of tissue um, and see where that takes me. Oh, that's a great. And then one of the last questions that I wanted to ask you is that you've kind of like started your own business where it helps with like clients. You have your own website, which we'll definitely link below. One of the things that I found when I started out this podcast was kind of when you start your own type of business, this isn't really like a business, it's a podcast, but when you start something of your own, it kind of becomes your day where you're constantly thinking about it. You're constantly worried about it. Like I know that you probably have nights where you can't go to sleep because you're like, oh my God, what's going to happen with this and everything? Because I have that too, just from doing this. How are you able to maintain a a good work-life balance where you aren't maybe stressed out as much about your business? Um, Are there any keys that you do to uh, kind of make sure that you aren't freaking out all the time about like, oh my God, what's going to happen with this? Mm -hmm. that's actually really important to do um, is incorporate rest days because when you have my mentality, the type A type personality, you want to just keep doing the same routine every day. No, that's the worst thing you can do for yourself. So what I do is I make sure to plan ahead. Mondays and Fridays are my rest days. So I just completely make sure that like on those days I have um, other things to do or I have, I'm going out with friends or I make sure to schedule off time and if I don't schedule the off time I'll ignore the off time Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. my biggest tip is to schedule literally schedule time off um, in order to force yourself to take the time off yeah it's yeah it's one of those things where I did I have laid off a little bit on working out as much as I used to but then once you get to that routine of working out so much it is very very hard to come out because it just feels like it's such a good part of your day it's almost like brushing your teeth or just any of your normal stuff where you're just like I have to work out I can't I can't do it but um obviously people are going to be in scenarios where they, they aren't going to be able to work out. Like maybe if you're doing a long travel day, if you're doing like going on a plane or if you have a lot of work to do, what are some of the best ways to kind of keep your mind from going crazy? Like if you can't schedule a day, like a a specific rest day, if like all of a sudden something just pops into your mind, what do you do personally? If there's like a day where you know that you aren't going to be able to work out. Um, like I'm traveling for example. Yeah. Um, not really much. I mean, honestly, I take a lot of, I've taken like three weeks off from the gym, just gone on. We, my family travels a lot. So like last year we went to Russia and Portugal and I took literally three or four weeks off of the gym and it's hard (laughs) the first week. And then you kind of just accept it and you're like, whatever, this is life. (laughs) I'm in in Russia right now. And like I could have worse problems. Oh, Absolutely. We are kind of suffering an obesity, I wouldn't say like crisis, but we do need to definitely watch a lot more of what we're eating and uh, make sure that we're getting enough proper exercise. What would you say is the number one important thing to to kind of like spread the awareness to people? Because a lot of people, you know, they'll just go and they'll have them at McDonald's or because it's super cheap or whatever, which is another myth that we we could talk about real quick if you want to, where everyone says, oh, fast food is so much cheaper. But then if you really go to some of these stores... The, vegetables and fruit can be just even cheaper than that. So, uh, how, how do you kind of get that awareness out? Um, I think it's just about not being lazy, not taking the easy way out and really committing to change. Um, I can't say enough how important whole food nutrition is. Um, not relying on protein shakes, not relying on protein bars, not doing all that really, you will see, you don't know how awful you feel until you feel this great. Mm -hmm. Um, And you take the time to actually change what you're eating. The gut is responsible for your mood, your thoughts, your activity, your energy level. It is responsible. It is the core, the center of everything that you do. If you don't treat it right, you're going to feel awful. Mm -hmm. So, and even to optimize your performance in the gym, like get your diet in check. That's the one thing I can say. Like, get your diet in check. 
that's another great piece of advice. And I mean, it was great having you on the show. Uh, I'll definitely leave a link below to everyone to follow you on Instagram. And I highly recommend everyone does that. She posts so much informative stuff where you'll learn so much about your body and ways that you can, you know, better yourself. And then there's so much inspiration too, and just wa- and just looking at some of the things that she posts. Um, do you have any, what, what are like your future goals when it comes to your page or maybe your brand? Do you have any plans to expand or how's that going? Um, I want to help as many people as I can. So feel free to reach out. Um, I love helping people. I just want everyone to learn how to be their best self and how to be their most positive self. So I'm happy to help. Um, feel free to reach out again. You'll have all my details yeah. for core restore whether you want to do gut health training or whether you want to focus on nutrition and gym and do just fit with dasha training um i really try and help everyone and anyone that i can in all ways so last last question here you have such a positive attitude where at least for this podcast you've had a really positive and i can tell that you're a positive person from all the instagram posts have you been like this your entire life or is it something that you developed or have you always been sort of a a person that likes to help out others Absolutely not. And I'm not always this happy. I am, I, again, I've worked so hard to get this level of positivity and I feel better when I'm this positive and I feel like others feel better when I'm this positive. So I've just been constantly working on becoming, again, the best version of myself and becoming the most positive version of myself. So um, it's an ongoing everyday battle. I don't think that I will ever reach some sort of like ultimate goal of you can't be any more happy. Um, But I just it's an ongoing process. And I think that everyone in life should really try and be yeah. more positive. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the number one key. Well, I mean, it was great having you on. We'll link all the stuff down below that your all your Instagram page will link your website and everyone get a, get a hold of her. If you want to ever have any tips or anything as well, she's more than willing to help anyone out. I mean, and we really, I think a lot of people need that. So, I mean, Make sure to give her a like too on Instagram. Make sure to go and follow her. You'll really enjoy the content. And I mean, it was great having you on. If you need anything, if you need to plug anything, if you have like new products coming out or new anything, just let me know. I'm more than happy to. And if you, we'd love to have you back on the show. Maybe some other time we can talk about some other topics. Uh, we 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 missed out on a few things now, but there's a lot of. I mean, we could have talked for 400 hours on all this specific stuff. But um, once again, this is Ryan Johnson with DD on the spot, and it was great having you on. And uh, have a great day, everyone.